so hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Danielle Daw. I'm the Adult Services Librarian here at the Halton Hills Public Library, and I will be your host for this evening. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Halton Hills Public Library is located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit on Treaty 19. I also want to thank the Friends of the Halton Hills Public Library and CFEW Georgetown for their support of the Halton Hills Lecture Series. Uh, so just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the Q&A for tonight's lecture is going to take place through the chat box. Um, so you'll find that in the bottom menu in Zoom. Um, and we just ask that when you submit your questions, you direct them to everyone so that we can see the questions coming in when we get to that portion of the event. Uh, tonight's lecture is also offered in partnership with CFEW Georgetown. Uh, so CFEW is a national women's equality seeking organization with over 100 clubs across Canada. Uh, and the Georgetown chapter is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. And over those last 50 years, the club has made uh, social, economic, uh, political, cultural, and environmental contributions uh, to our community. Um, so we want to congratulate them on 50 years uh, and thank them for their support of the lecture series. Now, if you are a CFUW member, um, please note that your meeting is going to immediately follow this lecture on the Zoom call. Um, so you can just stay on at the end of the event. Uh, please also note that we are recording tonight's presentation and then we'll make it available on YouTube later this month. All right, uh, so in 2016, the Ontario government passed legislation declaring the first week of November to be Treaties Recognition Week. Um, so events such as tonight's help us understand our history, um, our collective rights and obligations in order to foster a greater understanding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Uh, so we are joined by Darren Wimbanga tonight, uh, and he is the traditional knowledge and land use coordinator of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, so Darren will be discussing how in the late 17th century, the ancestors of the Mississaugas of the Credit found themselves stewards to approximately 4 million acres of land at this western end of Lake Ontario. Um, however, the encroachment of settlers and trees, um, such as the ones relevant to Halton region, really contributed to the erosion of their land base and to the decline of the people. Um, yet the Mississaugas are still with us today um, and they remain on their lands and are very proud of their resilience. Uh, so we are very honored to have Darren join us tonight and uh, I will pass it off to you, Darren. Uh, Ani uh, Bozo, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Thank you for the land acknowledgement. And it's my pleasure to talk to you about the history of the uh, Mississauga of the Credit First Nation and to, and to open up, uh, I suppose, I hope a dialogue uh, because there's much talk in this day and age of reconciliation. And I think one of the big important parts of reconciliation is getting to know each other before that process can even begin. Uh, by knowing each other, we can understand each other's hopes or aspirations and move along that path. So without further ado, I am going to try and share my screen again. And lo and behold, if I've done it correctly, you have the entire logo of the First Nation on there. Now I see some heads nodding. It sounds like I've got that. So that's a good thing. So I'm going to talk in my talk. We are still here because really, People don't realize in the greater Toronto area, and even most of Southern Ontario, uh, that First Nations are still here. And as the Mississaugas of the Credit, as pointed out earlier, were the treaty holders for much of the land at the western end of Lake Ontario. And most people don't realize that we're really fairly quiet people. I like to think that's because of our modesty, but, uh, well, you'll see if we're that modest by the time we're done. Uh, we used to be known as the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, but now we're known as the Mississaugas of the Credit because a few years ago, I was at a community meeting and one of the band members said, uh, what's this new in our name? We're not new, we're a very ancient people. Uh, why is that in there? And you know, that resonated with the chief and council and it also resonated with the band membership in general. So it was decided to remove the new from our name. And now we're just known as the Mississaugas of the Credit. And you'll see our logo, three fires symbolized on it that we belong to the Three Fires Confederacy. 
were aligned uh, with the Ojibwe, the Adawa, and the Potawatomi peoples. And you'll see the eagle at the center of our logo that represents that at one time, most of the Mississaugas of the credit belonged to the Eagle clan. We've got lots of other clans now amongst our people. I belong to the Bear clan, for example. Other people belong to the Otter clan or the Birch Bark clan. But really, it's just a way of organizing our families and the roles in the community back several hundred years ago. So we'll move on from there. So the Mississaugas, we belong to the Ojibwe Nation or a subgroup of the Ojibwe people. You might have heard the name Chippewa, same thing as Ojibwe, just another version of the name. Uh, in Anishinaabe, that's our language. Uh, we refer to ourselves as the human beings or the people. And finally, Mississaugas is really a name that the settlers tagged on to us. We're not really sure why ourselves. We have different theories depending on where you live at the end of the lake. The Mississaugas at the one end of the lake toward uh, Peterborough say it means uh, people that live near the mouths of many rivers. That's true because we did. Our people, the Mississaugas of the credits say, uh, Mississauga re resembles the word in Ojibwe, Megizi, which is the word for eagle. And eagle was our clan. So both good theories of how we got the name, but uh, still it's tagged on to us by the settlers anyway. And it really represents the Ojibwe people that live on the North shore of uh, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. But I will point out that we are an ancient people and we did not always live on the North shore of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Matter of fact, when explorers first encountered us, 1634, an explorer, a Jesuit by the name of uh, Jean Nicolette, found us along, discovered us I should say, along Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. That was our territory. Uh, so this is 1632, and the rest of the map shows the lay of the southern, the lay of the land for southern Ontario. So specifically for the Halton Hills area in 1634, you had the Huron Wendat people. Farther to the west, you had the Tobacco or the Putan people. South of them, you had the Neutral people. And then in what becomes New York State, you have the Haudenosaunee people. You know them today as the Six Nations Confederacy. Back then they were five nations, or you might have simply known of them as the Iroquois. But these are the people that are gonna figure in our story tonight and figure pretty prominently in our first nation. Now, so when the French first encountered us, they brought with them European trade goods. Wonderful thing, European trade goods, I, I say that if you can imagine we were up there hunting and gathering along the north shore of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, all of a sudden the Europeans are bringing us metal cooking pots. You know, could you imagine trying to cook in a birch bark pot, you know, heating up hot rocks and dumping them into a birch bark pot or trying to chop down a tree with a stone lashed to a, lashed to a stick? Well, European trade goods brought us iron, uh, iron axes, metal pots, uh, uh, metal knives, uh, cloth, all kinds of things that made life easier for our people. And it wasn't just for the Mississaugas, it was for everyone in Southern Ontario and in the region of what is now Quebec. And so if you look at the map here, the Mississaugas, the Tobaccos, the Wendat, and the Neutral, we all were trading with the French. The French are located along the St. Lawrence River, Montreal, Trois-Rivières, uh, Quebec. And uh, so that's who we're trading with. And we're all trading in beaver pelts. The Europeans had this wonderful fascination for beaver pelts with beaver pelts for their fur hats. Well, it really pushed things along in exploration. Well, we're trading with the French and the Haudenosaunee down below here in the Finger Lakes region, they are trading with the Dutch at this time. And they have a problem. They like the European trade goods too, but their problem rests on the fact that they've hunted already their beavers to near extinction. They were running out of pelts. And so what better way to obtain pelts than to cross over up past Lake Ontario and Lake Erie and move into Southern Ontario. 
And uh, so they do. About 1649, 1650, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy moves into southern Ontario and disperses the Wendats, the tobaccos, and the neutrals. Uh, some of the Wendats, what was left of them, moved to Quebec. They live in a village now today called Wendaki that are still here on Wendat people. Uh, some of the neutral were absorbed into the Haudenosaunee and uh, some of them fled westward. Same with the tobacco Indians. They also moved westward. Uh, and that, so at about 1652, 1653, historians don't always agree and it, neither does oral tradition. Southern Ontario became a beaver hunting land for the Haudenosaunee people. Okay, and so now the Haudenosaunee people take control of what becomes the Halton region. So, so far in a very short period of time, Halton's been controlled by the Huron-Wendat. They've been pushed out. Now they're controlled by the Haudenosaunee. So now you're going to see how the Mississaugas come to the picture. The Haudenosaunee were not content with staying in southern Ontario. They decided to uh, keep attacking and moving northward. And so they attack into the land of the Mississaugas and our allies, the other nations that are northward. And basically all of uh, this part of Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, and really the other Great Lakes as well, when you think of uh, Lake Superior and Lake Michigan, the whole Great Lakes region becomes inflamed in this, in something we call the Beaver Wars. The, the Haudenosaunee are fighting for those beaver pelts and they want to take control of that trade. So they keep moving northward until about 1685, 1690. Once again, oral tradition and history aren't always sure. The other Great Lakes nation attacked the Haudenosaunee. And you can see the paths that they took to do so. Specifically for the Mississaugas, we take this rather large, thick path here. And we have our first battle with the Haudenosaunee out by Aurelia. Defeated them there. And then we split off into two main groups. One group goes more easterly. And you know those folks today as the Mississauga nations of uh, Scugog, of uh, Alderville, Hiawatha, and Curve Lake. Those people still live there today. They're our sister First Nations. Our ancestors down at this end of the lake, the Mississaugas of the Credit ancestors, attack down the Humber Toronto Caring Place Trail and drive out the Haudenosaunee at this end of Lake Ontario. And eventually we have our last battle with the Haudenosaunee at Burlington Bay. And oral tradition tells us, and even Haudenosaunee oral tradition tells us that it was a terrible slaughter and that the Mississaugas left two warriors of the Iroquois alive with the express purpose of going back to New York State and telling the Haudenosaunee folks that they are not to return, that all of Southern Ontario is now an Anishinaabe homeland, our, our territory now. And so it is, and it has remained to the American Revolution. And you'll find out about the return of those folks. So the Mississaugas of the Credit Ancestors at the end of the Beaver Wars, we always say 1701, the Great Peace of Montreal, that's the end point of those wars. We find ourselves occupying, controlling, and exercising stewardship over about 4 million acres of land. And that land stretches from the Rouge River in the east all the way over to the headwaters of the Thames River, follow the Thames River down around Lake Erie, Long Point, follow it, follow it along the Niagara River, all the way back to the Rouge River, about 4 million acres of land that we today uh, claim as our territory. And uh, so now you understand how the Mississaugas now, so in the span of a boat, oh, you know, in that span of 50 some odd years or so, 
Halton region and the Halton Hills area changed hands three times. So a very bloody period in Halton history that some people just don't realize happened. But there it is. And so when we do land acknowledgments often you speak of the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, and you speak of the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, because once we moved into that territory, we've never left it. We've always stayed on the lands. So you'll notice here, I have a number of rivers marked out in our territory. And that's because of Mississauga people, we always lived on the, on the flats of rivers and creeks that flow into major bodies of water. That was true in Northern Ontario when we lived in Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. It's true here in Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. So if you wanna look, you would have found us 300 years ago at the mouth of the Don, at the mouth of the Humber, at Etobicoke, at the Credit River and so on. Even the Grand River, we had uh, villages. We pitched our wigwams. And we lived a very traditional lifestyle. We were hunters and gatherers. We could pick up our wigwams and go according to the seasons. We moved about the land. Unlike the Hurons and the Haudenosaunee folks that were here before us, who made large permanent villages where they would stay in position for 20, 25 years, we moved with the seasons. So you'll find very little archeological evidence of us on the land. But nevertheless, history records that we were there. We have the Europeans to thank for that, that they did record our presence on the land. So we're living this hunting, gathering lifestyle, fishing on all these creeks, salmon, the big thing for us in, in, uh, in Southern Ontario, uh, the main, one of our main foods. And we also engage in trade. Remember, we love those European trade goods. And we trade with the French, continue to trade with the French after we defeat the Iroquois. And enterprising people that we are, we also begin trading with the British as well. We tried to trade off, you know, play the big powers against each other. Uh, the British usually offered more durable goods at cheaper prices, but we found one of the things we could get off the uh, French was, uh, was more goods. And let's face it, the French never ever wanted our lands. The great thing about the French uh, controlling, uh, controlling the region was they never pestered us for lands. If they wanted land, it was something for a chapel or maybe a trading post, but they never required land, but that's gonna eventually change. So if you look at the rivers, our principal river of the Mississaugas is this one, number four. We called it the Missinihi in our language, which means the Trusting Creek. And uh, here is a picture of the Trusting Creek and you know how far it extends northward because you're very familiar with the area. And there's very, a very romanticized view of our wigwams pitched, uh, pitched, uh, pitched against a creek somewhere. I'm not sure where, but a very romanticized view. I'm not so sure our campsites were quite as neat as that. But anyway, the Missanihi, we gathered there every spring. You could, I always say it was the place for a Mississauga family reunion because in the summer, and in the winter, we were always dispersed throughout our lands. We all had areas of hunting and gathering. We would go throughout our territory and that's, that's what we would do. And every spring we would converge on the Credit River, all of us. And it was a time for ceremony. It was a time for finding marriage partners. It was a time to talk of uh, trade alliances. It was a time to talk maybe of warfare, but really, it's just a time for game and sport. So very important for us in the springtime at the Credit River. And so that's our principal river. And we get our name from that. Uh, and I'll tell you how we get our name. The French established a trading post near there about 1722. And as I said, we love to trade. And uh, sometimes we would need a, a pot or a trade good or a, uh, a pan or something. And we would go to the trader out of season and say, listen, can we have this trade good? We will pay you back with uh, pelts when our spring catch comes in. And uh, 
the trainer would say, yes, go ahead, do that. And he would extend credit to us. The Missanihi becomes known as the Credit River and we become known as the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit and have been known as that for, since that time. Oral tradition has it that we are always, we were good credit Indians too, that you could count on us to uh, pay. And if one of our band members could not pay the debt owed to the trader, our band would step in and someone would pay it. So we're kind of proud of uh, that. So a prosperous time, more or less, there's a few blips, uh, especially when the, uh, when the French are defeated by uh, the British. And then the British are the only game in town, and that makes a few interesting complications for us. But still, we were trading, we were prospering. All that changes in what I call the age of treaty making. And uh, the treaty making really, nothing new to us. We traded amongst, or we, pardon me, we, we, we had treaties amongst ourselves for years before the settlers ever came, and we memorialized them in wampum belts. And uh, later, after the British came and engaged in treaties, we engaged in writing. And mainly because treaties were just so complicated, not, not easy for us to memorize in, in the way we did with the wampum belts. And if you look at this, this is a picture of the Brant Tract Treaty. And uh, there's a map of the Brant Tract uh, lands, and there's the signatures of our chiefs. We call them dotums. It signifies the assent of our chiefs that we agree to the terms of the treaty. And of course, we didn't sign our names. We signed by these dotums. So you'll see an eagle dotum. Uh, you'll see an otter dotum here. You'll see a, 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 an elk dotum. And that just, like I said, that represented the clans that were involved in making the treaty and it involved the chief himself making the treaty on our behalf. So simply a treaty, I'm sure you folks know this, but some people don't know what treaties are. It's just a, it's an agreement negotiated between nations and it's formalized, whether it's in wampum or whether it's on paper and we had been doing it for years. So treaty making, nothing new. But it, like I said, it changes with the British and this is, the treaty belt from uh, 1764, the Treaty of Niagara. And I like this belt because it kind of gives us an idealized picture of what relationships were supposed to be like between the British and the First Nations. This is called the Silver Covenant Chain of Peace uh, Wampum Belt, given to us by the British in 1764. In that year, there was a tremendous meeting of First Nations at Niagara. Matter of fact, 40 First Nations from the Great Lakes region, including the Haudenosaunee folks. And this treaty was extended to us by the British to indicate that we were both living on the land and that we were both to live in harmony as allies and we would help each other. And if we ever needed help, we would pull on the covenant chain and the British would come to help us. And if they needed help, we would pull, they would pull on the covenant chain and we would come to their aid. By the way, when we participated in World War I and World War II, many of our people still believe we were answering the pull of that covenant chain from the British to participate in those, uh, in those conflicts in the War of 1812, a host of other conflicts. But anyway, here's the Wampa Belt and there's the two figures that signify the relationship holding hands, there is the First Nation representative, a uh, symbol of the First Nations, and here is the symbol of the British. And there's a joke in our First Nations that how do we tell them apart? Well, we always say, you can always tell the British representative because he has a black heart. And that's kind of a joke amongst our own people, but it kind of signifies to us May, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek tongue in cheek joke. It, uh, it kind of symbolized the way treaty making went for us. I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time here because time goes by so fast. So the American Revolution precipitates a period of treaty making for our people. Eight treaties with the crown. And I'm sure you are familiar with the story about the American Revolution. It was very hard, very hard to be a loyalist in 
and what becomes America. You could be tarred and feathered, your profit, your property could be confiscated, you could be thrown in jail. But if you could stay loyal and could make your way north of the Great Lakes, not by that I mean Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, you were offered land for your loyalty. And so the British had to make treaties to do that and for the for the settlement of the loyalists and so the mississaugas of the credit made eight treaties with the crown and you can see the full expanse the black line showing our treaty our territory and the different colors the various treaties that we entered into now the first treaty of course was a treaty at niagara and uh, for a few trade goods and 300 british coats they paid for a strip of land six miles deep on the west bank of the Niagara River, all well and fine. The band that negotiated the deal, Sir Guy Johnson, way back in 1781, joked to his friends, I did pay that much for the lands. The British coats that I paid the Mississaugas, I was going to give them anyway for just staying loyal to us during the conflict with the, with the Americans. So he thought he was pulling a fast one on us, and I suppose maybe he was. But it, it gave us, the, we, it helped us to know that the British recognized us as the occupiers, the stewards, and the controllers of the western end of Lake Ontario. The second treaty was for this large green tract of land. That's our Between the Lakes Treaty, reached, negotiated in 1784 ratified in 1792 and that was for loyalists as well but a very special group of loyalists remember those Haudenosaunee folks that we drove out at the end of the beaver wars and said don't come back well they fought for the British during the American Revolution under leadership of Joseph Brandt and uh, they lost their lands so Joseph Brandt approached Frederick Haldeman, the governor of Quebec, because that's what this land was known as at that time, and said, can we have land? We were loyal. We fought for the British cause. Now we lost our land. And he said, yes, go pick out a tract of land. And Joseph Brandt prick, prick, pardon me, picked out a tract of land at, from the mouth of the Grand River all the way to the headwaters. And uh, he picked out the land, but Frederick Haldeman, before he could award it to the Six Nations had to come to the Mississaugas and see if we would acquiesce to them living on the land, not to mention other loyalists as well. We agreed to do so, and that's how the Haudenosaunee moved back into southern Ontario and uh, make present, uh, make, make, well, they make themselves heard nowadays, I'm sure you well aware of that. And that tract of land is called the Haldeman Deed, the Haldeman Grant. It's not a treaty per se. Uh, but it is a grant or deed of land. So that's the next big treat now. And now we get to Halton region, you folks. I was just telling people before the talk here tonight, as we got started, that the Halton region are record holders because you have five treaties with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation contained within your region, five of them. And so you really are treaty partners in the region and I know I'm talking to Halton Hills people tonight, but the primary treaty for you folks is the Adjutants Treaty of 1818. So you can see the number, the first treaty is piece of the, uh, between the lakes treaty, this purple blotch. A treaty here is known as the Brant Tract Treaty and that was treaty award, uh, a piece of land awarded specifically to Joseph Brant for his own personal use. And that occupies uh, a large section of downtown Burlington today, where the Joseph Brandt Hospital is. And you see a large part of the region is the head of the Lake Treaty, 1806. The British, of course, want to join all the settlements around Lake Erie, uh, or Lake Ontario. And so that was a major piece of the puzzle, joining it together. And this big one, the adjutants uh, treaty that you folks uh, are on right now. So I just, well, maybe I'm gonna back up a little bit here and talk about treaty making for a bit. We reached eight treaties with the crown and those early treaties that we reached, especially the Niagara Treaty, the Between the Lakes Treaty, and even the first Toronto Purchase Treaty, we went in with not a complete understanding of what we were moving into. We thought we were sharing the land with the British. Uh, the settlers would come in, they would uh, build their farm, establish their farms, the settlements would be, would be built. 
And we would move about the land as we always did, hunting, fishing, gathering, because we had no concept of land ownership. If it wasn't ownership, I would say it was communal ownership, but we don't even like that word. We say we have a responsibility to look after the land and steward it. But the British terms I like to call the sole proprietorship of property. You buy a chunk of property, you own it lock, stock and barrel. And so in those early treaties, our land base was seriously diminished. And uh, that was very problematic for us because no longer we'd run, we'd move about the land and we'd suddenly find our forests cleared. We find farmers putting up fences. Uh, we find ourselves being regarded as trespassers on our own lands. And that was very difficult for us. Farmers shooting our dogs were being run off. And we finally said with the head of the Lake Treaty, this one here, we finally said to the government and Colonel Claus that negotiated the deal, Father, why did you treat us this way? We, we expected to learn things from the farmers and now we find ourselves treated badly, we're run off and our dogs are shot and we are not treated as we were promised, uh, Father. Nevertheless, we made the treat deal anyway. But the treaty for you folks is this adjutant's treaty. And I want you to understand by the time we made that treaty in 1818, we were in a very, very sorry state. Giving away our land base, suffering from disease brought by the settlers, our economic way of our economic land base collapsed, our traditional economy collapsed. We can no longer do what we once did. And so when we first made our treaties in 1781, that uh, Niagara Treaty, there was 500 Mississaugas at the western end of Lake Ontario. 10 years later, 1794, we're down to 400. 1805, 1804, we're around 300. You can see where this is going. Uh, by the time we get to 1818 and the adjutant's purchase, Colonel Claus comes to us and says, I see your people are thin and miserable. You have a large tract of land left that you're not using it lays idle. If we, if you will give it to us, we will provide you with enough food on a yearly basis to clothe your women and your children. And by that time, our population was just below 200 people. We thought we were going to be extinct. And so did the crown think we were going to be extinct. So we acquiesced to that. And uh, sadly enough, that's how I say we were coerced in that treaty. We could not fight for ourselves any longer. We had no land base left. And let me just see. Uh, so it was, it was very, very bad for us. There's the text of the adjutant's treaty. And I know you don't have time to read it now. And basically what I say it is, is a real, a real estate agreement. And that's really what it was for the Crown. They were getting property to own it lock, stock and barrel, and they would get, give us some consideration, about 522 pounds worth of trade goods a year to keep body and soul together of our people. So that's what the British thought they were getting. This is what we thought we were getting, an agreement to share the land. And I challenge anyone to look at our treaties today, any one of our Upper Canada treaties, they're all online. They did not take away our right to self-determination, our right of stewardship, our right to harvest, harvest, our right to be sustained by land, water, and resources. It never took away any of those. Our inherent rights are still intact, even though we can't, we can't use them anymore. There's just so much development that we could not sustain ourselves even if we wished. One of the challenges we face as First Nations people today is, uh, is how do we sustain ourselves in the 21st century in a new modern way? So those are the treaties. We went from 4 million acres of land to 200 acres of land in the span of about, uh, what is it, about 40 years. Now, maybe 50, closer to 50 years. So think about that tremendous collapse. All we're left with is 200 acres. And if you see this little brown spot here, a tenth of that is all we had left. 
So you can imagine the economic devastation to our people and the difficulty uh, we faced. So fortunately, this man came along. Everybody thought we were going to be extinct. We better keep watching the time here. His name is Reverend Peter Jones. Uh, his name is Kako Abenabi, which uh, means sacred waving feathers. Uh, He's got an interesting lineage. His mother is Tuba Bananaque, a Mississauga of the Credit Woman. And she had a dalliance, and that's all I can say. I, I, I don't know how to say it delicately. She had, uh, yeah, like I said, it's kind of a, a love, I don't know how to describe it politely, but she had an affair with the deputy provincial surveyor at the time, a man by the name of Augustus Jones. He looms large in Ontario history because he surveyed most of the townships in southern Ontario. But anyway, he had an affair with Tuba Bananaque, and out of it came two sons. Now, Augustus was a bit of a cad because he already had a, a wife elsewhere near Brantford. He had a wife elsewhere, so he left the boys from this affair to be raised by his mother's people at the credit. And so they grew up, Peter and his older brother John, learning everything they needed to know about good to be good Mississauga boys, hunt, fish, gather the ceremonies, the, the stories, all manner of things. But remember, we were supposed to be going extinct. So I like to think Augustus decided to take his boys away from the Credit River people and give them a settler education. And so the boys learned reading, writing, arithmetic and settler jobs. And one day, Peter decided to go to a camp meeting in Ancaster, Ontario. It was a camp meeting for the Methodists. You know them as the United Church people of today. Well, he converts to Methodism and he decides, and he takes to it like a duck to water. He becomes a very, very devout Methodist, as you can tell, he's a missionary, he's a, you know, he's an evangelist, that sort of thing. And he decides the way to save the Mississaugas of the credit from extinction is to convert them to Christianity, that's one. And two, give them a settler education, reading, writing, arithmetic, make them literate so they will not be taken advantage of in settler society. And I might add, part of that education is farming. And you know, by 1825, he has most of the Credit River Band converted to Christianity. And uh, there's always this myth out there that Christianity was imposed on the First Nations. It certainly wasn't imposed on us. We grasped, grasped at it. We knew we needed to change our world and life view. The old Manitous, the old ways, old gods, the old ways of doing things were not working for us anymore. So we knowingly, conscientiously made the conversion to Christianity. And, uh, and right after we did so, with the help of the government of Upper Canada, we built a village in uh, on the credit river and uh, we know it today we moved in in 1826 a complete transformation of our lifestyle the hunting and gathering days that weren't working for us anymore anyway we learned how to farm and be and so we become agriculturalists this is a farming mission village we're not interested in planting the indian crops of corn beans and squash we're interested in wheat oats, barley, the cash crops of the day. We learn all about animal husbandry. We learn about raising cows, chickens, horses, pigs, sheep. So we learn that. We learn to become literate. We learn literacy because to be good Christians, you have to read the Bible. And so right away, we learn to read. Our young people learn to read. And God will hand it to the young people. They teach old fogies, and I would have been an old fogie in those days, how to read. And so the young people kind of led the way in this new lifestyle for us. Uh, so we learn about business. We build a hospital. We build a school. But we also build sawmills, warehouses. We have a shoemaker. We have mechanic shops. And we also become the major shareholders of the Credit River Harbor Company. And we're responsible for building two piers out in the middle of Lake Ontario so we could ship goods back and forth. Uh, we build our own schooner, the Credit Chief, uh, so we can tra transport lumber and our goods. 
around Lake Ontario. So in the span of uh, 21 years we spent at the Mission Village, we completely transformed our lives. A tremendous, tremendous change for our people. You can see the dress. Here's a, this is a group of Mississauga people from the, I believe it's the Coldwater Reserve at the time, but they dressed much like the settlers, much as we did at the time. Uh, here's a picture of a schooner to show it's kind of representative of what we had that we built with our own funds. So I can't emphasize enough how, how much we transformed our lives. And we all worked at it too. There was this all, we're all in this together. Let's move along and develop. Like I said, the old ways did not suit us any longer. And so we adopted. And here's another picture of our mission village, but there's a problem. First Nations people cannot own their own land. And that was the case then, and it's the case now. Even though we developed the Credit River Mission Village, we cleared a couple thousand acres of land, built a village, had the farms, we could not get title to our lands. And that was always a concern that the government would snatch the lands away from us and tell us to move. Because we realized we were on a prime piece of real estate where, our, where we were located. Matter of fact, you might be familiar with that real estate now. It's known as the Credit River, or pardon me, the Mississauga Golf and Country Club. If you go there today, that is where our village was located. Now there's no sign of us because in 1847, the government did decide to put our lands up for sale and we were about to be homeless. And we didn't know what to do. Uh, where are we going to go? We can go to we can go to the Mississauga's far Mississauga's nations farther to the east, but we really weren't sure. But who comes to our rescue? Remember the Haudenosaunee folks that we drove out at the in the Beaver Wars and said, "Don't come back." Well, and then we talked about Treaty Number Three and how we. Uh, we acquiesced to that treaty so they could have a settlement the, uh, along the Grand River. Well, they remembered what we did for them during the American Revolution. And they said to us, we invite you to come and live with us because of what you did for us. When we were homeless, we will now return the favor to you. And so we took them up on their offer and uh, we moved in 1847 from our Credit River mission to what we call today new credit, just uh, south, uh, if you look in this map, just in this little southern, southern portion of the Six Nations Reserve. It's our own reserve today, of course, but at a time for a brief period of time, it was part of the Six. And so this is our lands now, uh, 4,800 acres of land in uh, Brant County, 1,200 acres of land in Haldeman County, we straddle both counties and we could never replicate what we had at the Credit River. And we, we could not, well, we don't have water for one thing. As Mississauga people, we always lived along water, whether it's the Northern Ontario, Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, down here around uh, Lake Ontario or the Credit River or the Humber or wherever. Here we moved to New Credit and we only have two small creeks and they dry up in the summer, I can assure you. There's going to be no schooner, no sawmills, uh, nothing of that nature. So for us, we've lost our spiritual connection to water and our cultural connection to water. But we are still very good farmers here at the Credit River, at, uh, at New Credit. But even the wheels fall off that. Uh, you can imagine by the time we're here for one generation, we move here in 1847, by the time 1867 comes around, we've had to split the land amongst our children. So the family farms become slightly smaller. Give it another 20 years, another generation, the family farms have to be split again. And so pretty soon the family farms can't support a family. The other problem is there's always new technology in farming. There's always new techniques, new combines, new new tractors, whatever. The great thing is settlers can go to the bank and get a loan to buy the new farming equipment, the new farming technology. But remember, I said before, I don't own my land today. The Mississaugas didn't own their land today. We live on our land solely because the government allows us to. 
and I have a certificate of possession. I'm sure many of you folks have deeds to your property. I have a certificate of possession that says I'm allowed to live where I am right now, and it's at the pleasure of the crown. And so I can't take out a loan at the bank because the bank can't take our land for collateral. And so we fall behind in farming as late as uh, 1920. Some of our people are still plowing with horses. And that, you know, during the late uh, early 1900s, the late 1800s, that necessitates another transformation of our lives. So we transition from agriculture and our people transition toward getting higher education and moving into farming and manufacturing work outside of our reserve. And that's a problem we face even today. Currently, the population of the of the band membership is 2,600 of us, but only about a third of that actually lives on the reserve proper. Most of us have to go somewhere else to uh, to to practice our uh, our jobs, to practice our crafts or our trades, and so that's what we do. Uh, we have some very. We have one person, uh, Judge Harry Laform of the Appellate Court of Ontario, is one of our band members. He had to go elsewhere to practice law. Uh, Dr. Malcolm King, associated with the World Health Organization and the United Nations in uh, health in the field of Indigenous health, had to go elsewhere. I myself was a teacher for I don't know how many years before I ever worked for the First Nation. Uh, so that's a problem we still face today, but we're always constantly in the process of transforming ourselves. And uh, so here's a modern picture of some of the buildings we have here at New Credit today. We've come a long way in a couple hundred years from wigwams on the bank, on the river banks. Uh, and we're always looking for ways. We have an energy company that we uh, own. We also uh, have a business development corporation that we own. We're always transitioning, we're always transforming and survival has meant that we have to do that. Uh, it's a very, very dynamic uh, way of living, I suppose, for our people. Uh, so I'm gonna close it out because I've already talked a little longer than I want to, but I just wanna close with a bit about reconciliation because that's, a, that's the watch word today. That's what we all want to hear. And, you know, I, uh, as a person whose own grandmother and great uncles and great aunts went to residential school and so on, and I deplore the conditions, I've heard the stories and I've visited the institution. I've, 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 I've heard it all and I don't want to dwell on that stuff because to say it irks me is to say the very least. But, uh, but I'm glad for one thing that that has come out nowadays and now we can begin talking it's we've got some impetus going into talking about reconciliation and uh, so i want to talk about that a little bit uh, i always say to people let's honor the spirit of the treaties our people still want to do honor the spirit of the treaties we want to share the land we still want to share the land and when we think about the lands today that's what we primarily think of. I love the fact that there's land acknowledgements all over the place now, again, recognizing that it is the treaty lands and territories uh, of our people and also the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat. And that's a very long history and that somehow got lost in, uh, in the shuffle. I love the fact that people know the Mississaugas of the credit. Uh, with the treaties they made, established, helped to establish that settlement of, uh, of the western end of Lake Ontario. The most heavily populated section of Ontario is on our treaty lands and territory. So I'm glad that we're getting somewhere with that. I'm glad that we're seeing work with the settlers, the settler folks in the wise stewardship of lands, waters, and resources. I'm glad to see that because we're natural allies. We say we want to share the lands and we want to keep them pristine for the next seven generations. We want to improve the lands. Seven generations for us just means forever, that that's what we want for everybody. And that's not just for our people, it's for our people. So I'm glad to see First Nations and settlers allied in the natural resources sector. And I say respect and honor the First Nations people because I largely think we've been ignored. That topic, we are still here. Yes, we are still here, but 
I want people to remember too that we are one of the founding peoples of Canada. Often you hear French and English and the First Nations are left out. I, I point out we made our contribution. And so as we go forward in reconciliation, I love this two row wampum belt. Uh, it's not our belt. It's a belt adopted by many of the Great Lakes people, including the Mississaugas. It's actually a Haudenosaunee belt. And the Haudenosaunee made this agreement with the Dutch. And like I said, we adopted it. One strand of purple wampum represents a settler ship. And the other strand of purple wampum represents indigenous canoe. And we're both going down the river together in parallel. And that was meant when the original agreement happened between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch, that we were not to interfere with each other's lives, that we were going to go parallel and we would not interfere. Well, I'm sorry, that ship has sailed. We've interfered. We've had interactions with each other for a couple hundred years now, some for good, some not so good. It's been there, it's happened. But what I think is important is this purple, these three beads, no, three beads strips make up this one larger white strip. And I say they represent peace, friendship, and respect. And I think that is symbolic of reconciliation. That's what's going to get the ball started. If we can greet each other with peace, respect, and friendship, we can go a long way toward reconciliation. We can't wait for the government to do it for us. That's never going to happen. But if the common people, I guess by that I mean not the government, if we can get a ground root swelling where we get together, we can understand each other and come to know each other, then I think we have this ground swell of support for reconciliation. And you've also, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen the 94 recommendations uh, coming out of the, uh, I wanna say Murray Sinclair report, but you know that the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. It's a big, it's a tall order. There's a lot to be done. But we can tackle it together one step at a time. But I think peace, friendship, and respect is the way to go. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there for now. I covered so much, and I never feel like I have enough time, ever feel like I have enough time. And so I'm going to open it up to questions now. Be gentle on me. It's been a long day. But uh, I'm always willing to open questions. And don't be afraid to ask anything. I realize for many people, I'm sometimes uh, doing the history talk, the first encounter you've had with an Indigenous person. And I've gotten some interesting questions this year, and sometimes questions are unsaid because they're scared to ask or offend our people. I always say, ask, and that's one thing I want you to know where you're, wherever you're from. You can feel free to ask our people anything, anywhere, and uh, we want to uh, extend that hand of friendship wherever we go. So ask away. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, so there is one question that's come in here. Um, just commenting that your presentation was very helpful, so thank you. Um, and they're wondering, do you know the population of the Mississaugas when they lived north of the Georgian Bay? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think there was ever a census taken by the French authorities at the time. My guess would be the size from the size of uh, the people that attacked the Haudenosaunee, there had to be several thousand. And remember, for a, a good part of the nation, of the Mississauga nation moved to the Peterborough area, the Curve Lake, the Scugog. So that was a substantial number of people, and that was warriors. So I'm thinking I have to factor in women and children and so on. Uh, so uh, easily there was a couple thousand, at least, of the Mississaugas, just the Mississaugas in, engaged. But I always point out the whole Anishinaabe nation was engaged in that war. So the poor Haudenosaunee didn't stand a chance, actually, when it come right down to it. But uh, that would be my guess for Northern Ontario anyway. And then there's another question that's come in. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on screen. If not, I'll apologize now uh, for the pronunciation. Um, but asking you to speak to the term uh, Michi Saigui Mishinabe. Well, I'll tell you what, I have no facility with the language. 
So I, I can't help you there. And that's maybe one of, the, one of the bad signs. It's only recently in the last 20 years, no, well, maybe not even that long, we have been trying to relearn our language. And we do get language speakers into our school. And now the children, after 20 years of constant education, they're leading the way again. They're learning the language and teaching us older ones what's going on with the language and how to speak it. It's coming back. I'm proud to say it's coming back, but I'm afraid I'm no help with that type of uh, thing. I usually have to run off and get a translator if there's something I don't understand myself. So I can't help you too much that way. And then um, another question that's come in was asking about um, kind of the history of the residential schools. I know you mentioned, I believe it was some aunts and uncles. Yes. Um, but how far into, um, you know, the current family situations has that gone down? Did it kind of stop at that generation? Uh, the last, one of my cousins actually was in a residential school at Mohawk Institute. And when the Mohawk Institute closed, and I'm probably going to be wrong on this, I'm saying the 1970s, early 1970s. I see somebody's head nodding, so that means a good thing. I'm not too far out. Uh, they they left the residential school. So up until the 1970s, some of our people were still in. I don't think it was quite as harsh and brutal at the Mohawk Institute then as the time my grandmother spent. Uh, I think there was some humanizing things that improved it a bit. But still, it was it was no way of doing things. Fortunately, Mississaugas of the Credit have largely escaped the residential school thing because we were big on education right from the start. And right away, our people were fairly good at adopting people or children that didn't have parents or so on so they could stay within the community. But sometimes, in the case of my grandmother, her, her mother died and... Uh, her father was a young man who had to work and there was no one at home to raise the four kids and they were all young kids. So there was no family that could take them in. So they went off to the residential school for a number of years. Uh, so the circumstances change from family to family and the reasons why, but not, not a good situation. And um, there was a follow-up question. Do you know, um, how many, I guess, specifically the Mississaugas, but maybe just in general, um, Indigenous peoples might live in the Halton Hills region now? Uh, in terms of Mississauga of the Credit First Nation band members, I'm not aware of any now. I'm sure there might be a handful, but up until, I haven't seen the census, I haven't seen our own band membership list in a while where it shows where everyone lives. I don't think there are ter a lot, but I know Halton does have a rather substantial amount of uh, urban indigenous folks that are not affiliated with any, not affiliated with us. They come from all over Canada that live in the Halton region. And in terms of Halton Hills specifically, probably not that many, not as many as Toronto, which I, I think Toronto has the biggest indigenous population in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. So I think there should be some drift in terms of Halton. We don't have a lot to do with the urban indigenous people, actually. We do advocate if they have needs or something, and we can help support them through our advocacy, but uh, we don't have a lot to do with the urban indigenous because they have such different concerns than we do here as treaty holders. We're always talking about land rights and indigenous rights and inherent rights. And the thing about urban indigenous folks They've often lost those rights because they left their territory and treaty land. And most people don't realize those rights are not portable. I just can't take my rights and move to Calgary and pound the table and say, I want rights here. I don't have them. They're not portable. So anyway, that's a whole other, whole other issue. But no, I don't have an actual number. Uh, and then acknowledging uh, marriage outside of the Mississauga Nation, um, could you just remind everyone what kind of currently defines membership in the band? Uh, right now, membership in the band has largely been determined by the Department of Indian Affairs. If uh, obviously, if you're, if one of your parents is Indigenous, you're in. Is more or less how it goes. There's a few rules about having a number of grandparents that were uh, in as well. I think they call it the two grandmother rule. 
it's, it's complicated stuff and I'm not part of the Midlands membership research office. But now a lot of bands are taking over their own membership rules, who can become a band member. And uh, we, ha we uh, have a rule that basically right now, as long as you have one parent that can prove affiliation with our band, you're in. And if you have a grandmother, you're in as well. But I don't know how far back our band membership holds to the rules anymore or holds to the new rules. Band membership is changing throughout uh, throughout Canada as every band takes over who's going to be belong to the membership. It's a, a very important part of self-determination. It probably shouldn't be the government that's determining, determining who the band membership is. It should be the people themselves. And that's part of the sovereignty aspect of things. So anyway, that's a long answer for nothing. Well, it does sound like it's uh, matrilineal then. You're saying the, the mother's- Oh, the matrilineal. Uh, no, it actually is patrilineal. Oh, okay. It is, we're we're pat patrilineal, but I, I use the example of mothers most often because maybe you don't realize that up until 1981, if, a, if an Indian woman married a white man, she lost her status. And so I always think of uh, mothers because we often have people joining up because the government said, listen, we were wrong. We shouldn't have done that. And so now many people come back to our membership through their mothers because they were robbed of that, of their Indian status when their mother married off the reserve. It's a sad state of affairs, but at least it's improving now. Yeah, and thank you for clarifying. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't know if you wanted to, I didn't know it was matrimonial, patrimonial stuff that you wanted to talk about. We could go down that rabbit hole too someday. Yeah. Uh, so somebody has um, submitted kind of a comment and a question here about the 1764 wampum belt. And there's commenting that it's very beautiful. Um, and they're wondering if it was made, um, you know, in a mutual fashion, um, you know, was it beaded by an artist? Uh, and just wondering, you know, at the time, was it put on display? Um, you know, what was kind of happening with it? And uh, where is it today? Oh, boy. Uh, of course, most First Nations have a copy of it. If I remember correctly, the Six Nations Next Door has a real one, going back that far. It's not the original. I'm going to point that out right away. The original was made by the British by the British in 1764, specifically for that Treaty of Niagara. The way it was, the belt was extended to the First Nation as a sign of the promise that we're going to live in harmony together. And that was a promise extended by the British. What we would do is accept that wampum belt. Thank you, that's a sign of your promise, your pledge. And then we would give it back to them, signifying that we were in agreement with each other. I believe the Smithsonian has a copy, original copy of the belt as well. Uh, but uh, the original one, the actual where it is, if it, even if it still does exist, I'm not certain right now. But I know copies abound out there. Uh, and there's actually two related questions who have come in here. So the first one I'll ask is, um, is it okay to use the term pioneer related to early European settlers, or is there another term we should be using, such as settlers? Do you have any perspective? Uh, I don't have any problem with saying pioneers. It, mind you, it does have that connotation of the beginning, that they're beginning, they're the first ones on the land. And so in that way, I can see where it can offend some First Nations people. I just say settlers, I like it because it includes everybody from 1800, well, you know, when the pioneer age started, all the way up till today, even our recent immigrants, I consider them part of the settlers too. And that, that's what they are. To me, everyone is a settler that is not indigenous. And that's just the way it is. So pioneer, I don't have a personal big objection to it, but I can see, understand where people would have some problems with that. Uh, and then along a similar line, um, somebody asked, how do you feel about settlers partaking in indigenous ritual, rituals? Um, such as the sweat lodges? I know our people don't have a problem with it. We have uh, sweat lodges here. Jeez. I don't know. I, I'm saying that now. I'm thinking, I know about COVID has 
kind of messed everything up. But before COVID, we used to have sweat lodges here regularly. And I think if you're invited and want to participate, by all means, go ahead. Just follow the protocol, whatever it is. For some of the sweat lodges and the women's sweats, you might be required to have a dress and to dress a certain way to uh, be respectful in these things. But just ask about the protocol. And I'm sure somebody will be willing to uh, teach you and lead you in the uh, in the right way there. But uh, if you if welcome has been extended, no problem. Uh, powwows, we often invite people to the dances themselves and say, okay, come and dance with us. Uh, and there's some will be some dances you will be told no, no one can participate in except, uh, for example, the Mississaugas or Indigenous people, uh, because there's some aspect of uh, sacred ceremony that uh, is involved uh, just for Indigenous people. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask again. But uh, you know, also be careful of uh, protocol. There's always some kind of rules involved somewhere. And it's kind of complicated sometimes. I'm sure I don't understand all the rules either. And uh, just comments you're saying, uh, thank you for your answers. They've been uh, very helpful. Good. Uh, and then someone else was wondering if you had any thoughts on land back. Oh boy, that's a tough one. And I usually avoid those questions, mainly because as First Nations, well, land back, of course, you know, is primarily the Haudenosaunee Six Nations folks fighting for a strip of land that, uh, for whatever reason, they lost. I'm not going to comment on even how they lost. I have a definite opinion on that, too. But it's their fight with the crown at this time. And I, I loathe to interfere in another First Nations quarrel with the Crown, because we have our own quarrels with the Crown too. And that's something people have to realize. We are separate nations and we each have our own issues, our own values, our own ways of looking at things. And we don't, we don't want to uh, interfere in those types of uh, in those types of disputes. I'm, I'm sure we would be terribly offended if the Haudenosaunee interfered with, with our quarrels with the Crown, and we have them too. But uh, it's just a matter of, I guess I would say, Indigenous protocol that we don't interfere unless specifically asked. And even then, we're very, very leery. And uh, of course, you know the history of the Six Nations and the Haudenosaunee. They have their own internal struggles within themselves between traditional government and elected band council government. So that adds another even more complicating factor to the whole story. So we tend to avoid those types of questions uh, about our neighbors. So that's, I know it's probably not the answer you want to hear, but it's the answer that keeps me out of trouble and the First Nation out of trouble. And I will just add for anyone um, who is interested in learning more, um, we did recently just confirm uh, Ksenia Williams to come talk about uh, land back, um, and that's going to be the evening of November 24th. Um, so registration is now live on our website if you want to hear a little bit more uh, from that perspective, um, she will be joining us. All right, uh, so I'm seeing a lot of uh, comments coming in. Someone shared some information on wampum belts. So uh, thank you everyone who's also popping some stuff into the comments. Uh, Darren, I guess at this time, just kind of one last question. Yep. You no, know, we were just talking about um, participation in uh, you know rituals and things. Is that a good way for us to learn more, or do you have any other recommendations for us to continue um, learning more about treaties and Indigenous peoples in general? Uh, I always love. We have a conference here at New Credit every year, apart from the COVID things, of course. But that's going to change again this year. Uh, we have a conference, a two-day conference every day, or pardon me, three-day conference every year that talks about the history of the Mississauga nations and along the North Shore of Lake Ontario. So that always occurs in February of every year. So we welcome everybody to come to that conference. It's just not for the Mississauga folks, uh, our people. It was originally meant for our people, but now we've opened it up to anybody that wants to come and learn. I always say, get together and have more meetings such as this and attend different meetings like this to get to know each other, read things, uh, know the history. Uh, I, I, I can't say that enough. Uh, that's, uh, that's all part of that reconciliation process. I don't, I don't know if jumping into ceremony right away is a good thing. I think you have to 
to learn of a bit of an attitude about it. I've always kind of been embarrassed by, how do I say it? And I say it nicely too, by settlers that jump into indigenous things and they're more enthusiastic than the settlers, uh, the than the indigenous themselves. I see some people that enter into indigenous dances out there and they're more enthusiastic than the Indians are. And I know that's nice and it shows some, but uh, you know, there's too much zeal sometimes. I, I don't know how to say it in a polite way. I appreciate it, but it's a little over the top sometimes. I take take some time and learn about the people and then enter into that uh, stuff when you feel confident. All right, well, thank you very much, Darren. Um, lots of comments coming in as well from the audience, thanking you for attending. Um, so we really do appreciate you taking the time tonight um, to talk about the treaties. Uh, and to answer our questions. It's been my pleasure. I very much enjoyed doing it. So, chi me guetch. And uh, for everyone on the call, if you did enjoy tonight's presentation, um, we have a couple events actually coming up in our Exploring Indigenous Roots series. So head over to our website to learn more. Um, you also have the uh, chance still to sign up for our November film as well. Um, we are screening a digitally Jordan River Anderson, The Messenger. Um, I had the chance to see it at TIFF a few years ago. It was uh, very enlightening uh, and discusses um, healthcare and access to healthcare for Indigenous children. Um, so if this is something you're interested in learning more about, um, I do recommend you sign up for that uh, and you'll have two weeks to view the film. All right, so at this time, if you're a CFUW member, um, please remain on the call and we will uh, move over to your meeting shortly. Um, otherwise, thank you once again, Darren, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you for to the, the audience for coming and participating. And as well, thank you to our sponsors, the Friends of the Halton Hills Public Library and CFEW Georgetown. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Chimigwech. Good night. Thanks, Darren.